Well, joining me today uh, to look through all those, uh, in fact, uh, someone tweeted last week, is there a current affairs programme without Ian Dale on it? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. The LBC presenter Ian Dale is here. Uh, uh, your guest booking, Adam. <laughs> and so is Beata uh, Farnbulla, uh, 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 who the former Labour advisor, now chief executive of the New Economics uh, Foundation. Welcome to you both and uh, you. Uh, uh, good to see you. Now, um, is getting out of uh, the European Union Brexit with uh, some sort of solution on the Irish border, is it akin to the moon landing, as Boris Johnson suggests? Well, morning? I can see the point he's making. I mean, it, it, there is technology out there. Even the European Union itself admitted that there was not that long ago. So you'd think if we can get people on the moon 50 years ago, we ought to be able to well, uh, get the technology. Well, Americans on the moon, not us, yeah. Well, I know, we, we've done things similar, haven't we, Adam? Let's not do ourselves down. We've, we've got to peddle optimism, to coin a phrase. Um, this is going to, look, this is going to define Boris Johnson's premiership. He either gets us out on the 31st of October, with or without a deal, or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, he's toast. He will be one of the shortest serving Prime Ministers in British history, the Lady Jane Grey of our days. The um, deadline is November the 19th. If he's out before November the 19th, he'll is be it? the shortest serving, uh, well, shorter than George Canning. Well, it, it's not impossible. Um, because I've always said that he's, he's, a, he's got the sort of personality where I can see that he could be a brilliant Prime Minister in some ways, but he could also be a god-awful Prime Minister, and there's not much in between, no shades of grey, Lady Jane or otherwise. What do you reckon, this, this optimism? I mean, that's what people are crying out for, isn't it? A bit of Look, optimism. I, I'm the perennial optimist, and, you know, his sort of... <laughs> I can bl sense yeah, I know, <laughs> his, his blind faith would be laudable um, if it wasn't people's livelihoods, if it wasn't people's jobs that he was gambling with. And I think the difficulty is he has boxed himself in because he said of the backstop that it must be deleted. He's also said the 31st of October, do or die. And it's quite hard to see how he squares that circle. Well, he squares and, it with a bit of optimism and the sort of spirit that got us to the moon. Well, mm, yes, possibly. But he's going to have to negotiate with the EU. There's no... Particularly, you've been in all these hustings listen, listening to this. Are you convinced that there are alternative arrangements out there that can work from the 1st of November? Well, whether they can work from the 1st of November or not, I have no idea. I think there are alternative arrangements, so you don't have to check things actually on the border. It happens on, in other countries. It happens within the European Union. There is technology, but whether you can actually get it up and running for the 31st of October, I, I have my doubts. Now, look, there will be some sort of fudge here. If he gets us out on the 31st of October, there will have to be some sort of fudge, I imagine, because I can't, I can't see a pathway. Um, they've been, Boris Johnson's people have been briefing this morning, so I hear, that, well, that he's not going to go on a whistle-stop tour of Europe. Europe has got to come to us. Not quite sure that's going to happen. Not sure they're going to break off their holidays no. to come to Downing Street. Anyway, but now, uh, when you get a change of Prime Minister, it's always a time for compare and contrast, and we've got rival columns on what to do about this from... Tony Blair in The Times, Gordon Brown in The Guardian. Uh, who do you find more persuasive? Well, I mean, look, they're both making the same point, which is we're now... Makes a change. Oh, well, we're just... <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not quite, they're not quite. Well, Mr well, Blair's more enthusiastic no, about another referendum. No, but, but, but the fundamental point at the heart of this is that we're staring down the barrel of a no deal, which will be an absolute disaster. All credible economists say a no deal will hit our economy. And, you know, the thing that really troubles me about a no deal is that it is the communities that have been under huge amounts of pressure, families that are really struggling that will be hit the hardest. So they're like, why would we have this act of economic self-harm. Now, Gordon Brown says it's up to MPs to stand up to that. And, you know, my view is when MPs look at the facts, they look at the reality, and they think about the fact that they have to stare their constituents in the eye, they will take a stand against no deal. Tony Blair says a second referendum is the only way out of this. And actually, when you look at the mess that we've got ourselves into, and yes, the optimism of Boris maybe might save us in some way, but it's quite hard to see how he gets the numbers to stack up, which means he'll be confronted with either a general election or he'll be confronted with a second referendum. Now, the problem with the general election is that I'm not sure it will resolve anything because there will be lots of issues at play. And in the end, we're in a kind of four-way politics at the moment. So we might end up with another hung parliament. We might end up with a Brexit party um, and Conservative Party coalition or a progressive coalition of Lib Dems, Labour and SNP. Who knows? But it won't resolve Brexit. 
The way we resolve Brexit, I'm afraid, having got ourselves into such a bind, is to take it back to the people and ask the question. And actually, the question should be no deal, because I don't believe there's any sort of electoral or democratic mandate for no deal, and remain, and let the public decide which path is best for well, the country. Well, at least, I mean, Tony Blair at least has the grace to say it should be no deal or remain, um, rather than Theresa May's deal, which <laughs> surely now is dead. I mean, Gordon Brown is preaching to the converted in this article in The Guardian, um, but he's making the mistake that George Osborne made in, in the latter stages of the referendum campaign, a catalogue of gloom and doom and disaster predictions. I think well, it's called realism and well, reality. Well, I don't think it is when he says, the following day there will be long queues at Dover. By Saturday, many of our motorways will be at a standstill. By Sunday, food prices will be up 10%. On Monday, the pound will be sharply down. By Tuesday, medical drugs from mainland Europe will be less accessible. Well, what a load of rubbish. Well, as you know, P.G. Woodhouse said it's never difficult. Got to tell the difference between a ray of sunshine and a sweat with a green <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. In, in his yeah, defense, what's your Twitter he, now, Adam? In his defense, <laughs> I think he's just quoting the civil service contingency oh, plans that, that, <laughs> the, no, no. that sort of described the implications. Even, of the even of the that no doesn't go that far. Now, um, you've got Trevor Kavanagh there, um, a column. He's going big on the, the Churchill comparison. How well, do you feel about the Churchill comparison? Well, Boris loves the Churchill comparison. Well, he obviously, obviously he wrote book a book. It, yeah. And you, you can see sort of slight elements in his personality where you can make that comparison. But in the end, he's got to be judged on his own merits. And um, I got into a lot of trouble last week when I said, well, but in, inside that cocoon of bluster, there is a statesman waiting to emerge. Now, we will see. The thing that we have to do now, surely, as a country, is to give him a bit of fair win. Everybody sort of say, oh, he's going to be disastrous. Well, he may be disastrous for all I know, but let's at least give the guy a bit of a chance. So I agree with that. We have no choice. He is set to be our next prime minister. And actually, for the good of the country, my goodness, I hope he is better than his record suggests. But at this moment in time, all we can well, go... Well, he was when he was mayor of London. You see, was that's the he thing. Actually... He, he wasn't a bad mayor of London. He, he did a lot better than his critics thought he would at the beginning. He I did... think you can agree with that. I, I agree with that, but he also wasted a huge amount of money, and there's a question about the actual tangible impacts he delivered as mayor. But this is a much bigger job at a really critical time for the country, critical both in terms of Brexit, but also we're a really divided country where our politics is hugely toxic. And my problem is that everything he has peddled goes against that. So I'm struggling to see how he will be the Prime Minister, well, and I agree, we should give him fair wind, but it's hard to see how he's the guy that's going to knit this country together think he's, and bridge our politics. I think he's going to be a very different kind of Prime Minister in the way he runs the government. I don't think there will be this centralised control that there has been over the last 10 or 20 years. I think he'll be more of a chairman of the board and actually let cabinet ministers run their own department. That may not last long, but I think that's how he intends to start. OK, lots more to talk about in the next hour. Uh, Boris Johnson... Uh, was writing it's likely to be his what may well be his final telegraph column uh, when he calls on the UK to summon up the can-do spirit of 1960s America to solve the Irish border issue and with it Brexit. Uh, and in the telegraph cartoon, the Chancellor Philip Hammond, who said he'll quit on Wednesday if Mr Johnson becomes Prime Minister, is jumping before he can be pushed. Uh, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown insists that in The Guardian that it's still not too late for MPs to stop the calamity of a no-deal Brexit, while Mr Brown's predecessor, Tony Blair, pops up in The Times, arguing that a second referendum will be Mr Johnson's only way out of the Brexit deadlock. In The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh thinks a snap election is far more likely and will prove a Winston Churchill moment. Uh, back in The Guardian, John Harris argues that Mr Johnson's like the elevation to Prime Minister is the latest stage in the advance of the populist and the sense that politics everywhere is in a state of complete unpredictability. Uh, the Mirror's Kevin Maguire says Boris Johnson has kippered his premiership before it even starts and then Britain will soon be yelling for it to be over. The diplomatic crisis with Iran finds itself dropping into Mr Johnson's number 10 in tray. That's in the Times a cartoon. It's also the theme of the Guardian's cartoon, Mr Johnson arriving on board Donald Trump's destroyer courtesy of the infamous zip wire. Uh, the tensions with Iran are the result of Tehran's regime coming under increasing pressure to up the ante. Sanam Vakil uh, from Chatham House argues in The Guardian and in The Times, Jeremy Corbyn finds a perhaps unlikely supporter in Edward Lucas who says private schools should lose their tax breaks if they fail to put poor pupils before the super rich. Well, join me today to look through those are the LBC presenter Ian Dale and Miata Fanbola. 
the former Labour advisor and now chief executive of the New Economics Foundation. And I should also say, Ian Dale will be appearing on the fringe of the Edinburgh Festival at the Golden Balloon. His Gilded sessions, Balloon. His, Gilded Balloon. Gilded, Gilded Balloon. <laughs> his sessions are selling out, but there are still one or two tickets left. They are in. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks. Much appreciated. Now, um, we got that cartoon in the Telegraph of. Um, uh, Philip Hammond jumping before he's uh, booted out. We've had Alan Duncan this morning. Uh, doesn't look like a party in a harmonious mood, does it? No, it's not. And I mean, look, uh, Hammond was never really going to serve um, as Chancellor on, under Prime Minister Johnson. Uh, Got to get used to saying that. <laughs> uh, so it makes sense for him to, you know, leave on his own uh, accord. I think what's really interesting is we now have a rump of pro-European MPs in the backbenchers, um, very powerful. Um, I don't agree with a lot of things that Philip Hammond has said, but you know, he's a credible voice. Um, and I think this creates a problem um, for a Johnson administration because he now needs to think about how he both co-ops, works, engages with these set of MPs that essentially have threatened that they might bring his government down. I mean, Philip Hammond, Margot James, now Sir Alan Duncan. I mean, these are people who've done the state some service, to use that phrase. Aren't they? Margot James, I can understand she resigned on a point of principle. Uh, Philip Hammond, I thought yesterday, was just being gratuitous. And Alan Duncan today, frankly, who gives a damn about Alan Duncan resigning the Monday before uh, Boris Johnson well, takes over? He's been an effective foreign minister. Uh, well, I'm I mean, sorry, he's responsible it, it, for large parts of the world. To resign on a day when Britain is in a state of conflict with Iran as a foreign office minister just because you don't like Boris Johnson, I'm sorry, that, that is not the sort of well, thing that Boris a responsible Johnson's foreign office minister... Well, then... There is a sense of decorum about these things. You, you, you normally, in any other administration, you've waited. But p people are having a go at Boris Johnson. Look, you know, Adam, I've not been a great advocate of Boris Johnson over the years. So I, but I do think that if the Conservative Party is to have any semblance of unity, people like Alan Duncan actually need to think about the party before themselves. Perhaps he's thinking about the country. Well, well, I mean, what do you how, think how of the behaviour? What, does what that about the, the country? point of leaving this job vacant at this time? Well, I, I don't think it is the right time to leave the job vacant, but I, 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 I don't know the man, but I'm assuming there's a strength of feeling. He worked with Boris Johnson in the Foreign Office. Um, he's sort of seen him in action in high office and presumably has real reservations and well, concerns, which is the reason why... Well, fine, then go with a bit of dignity on the day that the, he does the reshuffle. I think he's trying to make a political point, which is I don't think this is the right man to lead the country at such a difficult well, time for the he's country. He's made that point very clear over the last few months. I mean, and you do put your finger on something, which actually I think is reflected in both Trevor Kavanagh and Kevin Maguire's columns. I mean, these are friends of mine, they're journalists who work hard. Ma, it's all getting very shrill and abusive, though, isn't it? Uh, part of me thinks that we ain't seen nothing yet, that the next few months are going to be the most argumentative, the nastiest uh, that we've seen in politics for a long time. And because Boris Johnson is seen as a divisive figure, not just on the left, but on parts of his own side too, I think he's going to find it incredibly difficult to not only unify his party, but also the country. And nothing is going to really happen until we have left. And if we don't leave, in the timetable that he's set out, um, and we talked about it an hour ago, I, I think he's going to be in severe difficulties. Um, there are some people who think, well, the way to get around this is to have an election earlier. I mean, I've had a couple of texts in the hour that we've been uh, off uh, saying, well, what about if he called an election literally this week and, and, and put it to the people immediately? What would the result of that be? I can't really see him doing that, but you never know. Well, so, I mean, the point about an election also, this kind of relates to Kevin Maguire's point, who is pretty damning, incompetent, inept, idle, and a fake news machine in the mould of his US master. So you can't be more damning than that. But for me, the really interesting point that sits behind this is, what's he trying to do for the country? So we know Brexit, uh, we know 31st do or die, but actually, what's his bigger programme for the country? And, you know, for me, you know, beyond Brexit is a story of a country that's under huge amounts of pressure, um, where we've had wage stagnation for a decade, where we have communities under pressure. And it's not clear to me what a Johnson administration is going to do about this. You know, through the hustings, he talked about uh, tax cuts for uh, the better off, um, even his more, if you like, inclusive policy around um, the threshold at which we pay yeah. national insurance. You know, our analysis suggests the top 20% will gain about £560 from this, the bottom 20% £80. 
So what's he trying to do but, for a country where we've got 14 million people that are living in poverty, where we have communities under pressure? It's Education all gloom and, and doom. Well, it? no, but that it, does, it, but it does bring us to the John Harris column, um, which I think is interesting. I mean, really saying a lot of the unrest, if you like, the, the unhappiness is to do with technology in, in particular, and we, and we ha haven't really grasped this yet. Well, technology is always something which people fear because they fear that it, it might take their jobs. When well, it is taking Well, when job. you and I were growing up, we, mm. we were told that computers would take everyone's job. In fact, computerization uh, created a huge number of jobs and more than offset the jobs that were, were lost because of it. Now, um, AI and all of that at the moment, I think people are rather uh, scared of. Um, but where there is a threat, there is often an opportunity to use uh, possibly a Boris Johnson phrase. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I would take a wider point than John Harris. I mean, I think his point is that technological change is driving disruption in the labour market. And actually, all of the kind of uh, social dislocation we're seeing is a consequence of that. But I think it's a wider problem, you know. So I would argue, yes, it's technological change, but actually it's the fact that our economy is just not working for people. So when we've had growth, but actually the majority of people aren't benefiting, when people are have been squeezed, haven't had a pay rise, there is a sense of anger and frustration out there in the country. And, you know, what I find completely bizarre is in all the debate about Brexit, three years talking about the ins and outs of how we leave, whether we leave, no one's talking about the fundamental problems that drove the Brexit vote. Communities left behind, families that are struggling to feed their kids. That's the problem we need to confront. And what troubles me and troubled me about the Tory leadership election and troubles me about Prime Minister Johnson to be is I have no idea what he's going to do to solve any of those problems. Well, it would be like Theresa May. Uh, she, she stood on the steps of Downing Street and offered out this quite positive vision, which a lot of people on the left bought yeah. into as well. But she was scuppered by Brexit. And if Boris Johnson doesn't get us out of the EU, so will he. And there won't be a Johnson domestic agenda because he won't be there to lead it. Well, yeah, but I would argue, you know, you've wanted to be prime minister for a, a very long time. I hope you have a plan for the country. And, you know, we were told, oh, you, let's let the leadership debate go on. We'll see through the hustings what his plan is. And I've heard tax cut for the rich. I've heard education. Good. I support that. And broadband. And my response is this housing, wage stagnation. Well, you it, you, this, you, you keep talking any... about wage stagnation as if it was still going on, but of course wages are now rising far faster than inflation, and that's been happening for at least the last six months, if not a year. It's cyclical. So over the last 10 years, we have moments where wages go up, and then we have moments where it goes down. The point is, today, wages are lower than they were before yeah, the financial but they are, crisis. But they are rising well, they have risen, faster than inflation. Well, they have risen faster than inflation at different points over the last 10 years, but the no, trend is the trend. For the last year. For the last My year. My point is... Don't admit it, for the last yes, year. Yes, absolutely, but over the course of the last 10 years, We've had moments yeah. where wages have outstripped inflation, and then we have moments where it's Indeed. kind of gone back. So the broad but the trend, trend, now, the trend now is quite clear, isn't it? It's not clear because it goes up and down. It's cyclical. Well, but it's the, clear the, over the, last the wider year. point is, people are still earning less than they should have had we been on a different trajectory. So someone well, had, needs yeah. to confront this. And had this. the financial crash not happened, obviously that would have been very different. Well, one could argue it's also about your domestic policy agenda. It's about your economic agenda. Like, what are the big reforms? You know, how are we trying to shift economic well, activity the, the, in different parts of the country? The key thing for the Boris Johnson government, if they want to win an election, if, if the election doesn't come to 2022, housing is the big issue. What do you think the chances of that are? Well, None. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you both very much indeed.